Welcome back to Face the Nation. I'm John Dickerson. Gwen Ifill is the co-anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. New York Times Magazine chief national correspondent Mark Leibovich wrote the cover story in today's magazine about Hillary Clinton. Ruth Marcus is a columnist for The Washington Post. And Robert Costa is a national political reporter for The Washington Post. Welcome to all of you. We're going to start with now the reaction to Donald Trump. And let's take a listen. Donald Trump owes every American veteran, and in particular, John McCain, an apology. I denounce Donald Trump for that. Uh, he needs to apologize uh, to Senator McCain and all the other men and women who wore the uniform. That's just a disgrace. The good people of Iowa, the good people of New Hampshire, and the good people of South Carolina are going to figure this out. And here's what I think they're going to say. Donald Trump, you're fired. <laughs> well, Gwen, that was all the Republican candidates jumping on top of Donald Trump. Is this, it, is this it for him? Not necessarily. There are three audiences for what Donald Trump does and says. There are the Republicans who are interested, perhaps, in getting the people Donald Trump appeals to, who John McCain so memorably called the crazies. And that's why you hear people, some, someone like Ted Cruz saying, he's my friend, and I'm not going to join into the media effort to denounce him, even though now every other Republican is. There are the crazies, as they are called, but really what they are are the, are the shouters, the ones who are angry that people aren't shouting loudly enough. They like that Donald Trump shouts. And the other audience are Democrats who are just loving this. And Hillary Clinton gets to make hair jokes about Donald Trump instead of about herself. And, the, and because of that, Donald Trump isn't particularly interested in going anywhere. He can't be shamed out of any of this, clearly. And so I think the reaction is we're going to be through this into the next debate at least. Mark, uh, Republicans were pretty slow to criticize Trump when he talked about Mexicans. Here they were doing it in the same tweet cycle, if that's even a phrase. In, in the <laughs> same tweet cycle. No, it is. Uh, he obviously touched a third ra rail when you came to John McCain. Not specifically, but John McCain is a, is a military hero. I mean, that is something that is to this point at least, been a universal point of agreement for, for Republicans, Democrats, and, and what have you. So, yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, there's going to be this static around the Mexican comment and then this, which I think gives you a sense of priorities. And I think Hillary Clinton's been very, very kind of deft in exploiting that in the last 24 hours. Robert, you've spent some time with Trump and a lot of time with Republican voters out there. Give us a sense of what the the real electorate is there for him and that he's keying into and whether there's another candidate that electorate would go to. When I was at that Arizona rally, you got the sense that these are, these are people who are almost apolitical. They're not really conservative activists in the traditional sense. They're people frustrated with the political process. They want to see an outsider come in and just be a bull in the China shop. But the most striking thing to me, being on the plane with Trump, uh, flying from Phoenix to New York, is that there is no John Podesta no Karl Rove, no senior political elder at his side who can candidly speak to the candidate in a moment of crisis such as this and really tell him how it is. He's I surrounded think if they by. If did, they'd be fired. Right, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> He'd say, You're fired. And that's the problem for Trump. He has some ability to, to hold a crowd, but when it comes to having a political apparatus, he just doesn't have it. But Right. But, but also, though, I mean, I think the reason the quote-unquote crazies love Donald Trump is he doesn't have a John Podesta or yeah. a Karo of it as a side. I mean, he has been able to separate himself from the politics and become the other of this race, which is a very coveted spot in this primary. And I don't think this is the end, but I think, and this may be a little bit wishful thinking, it might be the beginning of the end. But I think what this Trump episode, and I hope it's just an episode, tells us it's about two things. One, it tells us something about the state of the Republican Party and the degree of anger and animosity and unrest that a segment of the party feels. And that's bad news, I think, for some of the more mainstream candidates. It also is another one of these hurdles that's in front of the more, let's call them, credible candidates um, and how they respond to Trump, not just this one, which was really a no-brainer in how to respond to his outrageous comments about uh, John McCain. But in terms of the, the lag that they've had in responding to his previous comments about Mexican rapists, about whether where uh, President Obama was born, even yesterday we didn't pay attention to it because what he said about McCain was so outrageous. He was asked by Frank Luntz whether he thought the president loved America and he said he didn't know. Come on. There's a reason for that lag, though. I mean, this is a leaderless yeah. party in many ways. Reince Priebus, the chairman, tried to ask Trump to tone it down. Trump, of course, ignored him, continued to plow forward. Who could actually speak up right now and really contest Trump? This is a party that has a crowded field, people, no real leader, people, no presumptive nominee. So the people who can speak up are the people who have a sense of 
backbone and decency and understand, as Lindsey Graham has been very outspoken on Donald Trump, uh, who have a sense of really what crosses the line and also what in the long term is not best for them, maybe with these voters, but what's best for the party. Gwen, you talked to Ted Cruz, who is not who is not speaking up. What did you make of him? Is he being blotted out by the It's Trump interesting. Well, I asked Trump? Ted Cruz, this is the day he was going up to meet with, Ted, with uh, Donald Trump, who that morning had said, I don't know why I'm meeting with Ted Cruz. And so Ted Cruz didn't seem that insulted by that. He said, it's the media which is forcing us to denounce this man. I won't. He's my friend. So he goes up there. They pose for a picture, and it's fine. And a few days, and I, the other question I asked Ted Cruz was, is Donald Trump even a conservative? Right? This is a good question from, from someone who's like... You mean, like, what does he actually believe about the policies? What does he actually policies? believe about the policies? And he said, oh, well, we'll see. He was willing to say, we'll see about Donald Trump. And then yesterday after this, he said basically the same thing. He got to give him points for consistency. But there's someone in the race who's not willing to write him off yet. And part of that is when you've got 15 people competing for the same right. narrow slivers, why, why would you write off any segment of the voting population who might just actually show up? He also, though, I mean, he's also the logical extension of a political system that has come to revere celebrity, not a political system, a, a culture that comes to revere... Trump is. To, Trump is. To revere celebrity on any merit whatsoever. There's no okay. there's no standard, and also money, a political system are, in which money can be the game Are you changer. suggesting a Kardashian's going to throw her hat into the Democratic race? Um, why you know, do you it, think it, that it that's might. impossible? <laughs> <laughs> not many seems to be possible these days.